Hi, my name is Kathy Athey. I'm here on behalf of AHEM Western Region, highlighting our new biography series entitled PFS Profiles in Courage. I have the sincere and great pleasure today to be sitting next to George Coleman, partner in Stevenson, Aquisto, and Coleman. For over 40 years, George Coleman has been involved in representing over 100 healthcare providers in revenue recovery and business office consulting, assisting in creating on-site programs in public and private hospitals, as well as specialized insurance and third-party recovery programs. George is admitted to both the New York and California state bars. George is also admitted to the United States Supreme Court. George serves also as national legal counsel to the American Association of Healthcare Administrative Management, AHEM. George has lectured extensively and published many articles in the areas of accounts receivable, legal recoveries, and business office issues throughout the country. George is married and has four children, four grandchildren. And George, you had mentioned earlier that it's soon not to be four grandchildren, it will be... Five grandchildren. One more. Yeah, next July. It's coming July, so next year at this time there'll be five Grandchildren. Do we know the sex of the new grandchild? It is another girl. Lovely. So we have... I have one name? boy as a grandson who happens to have uh, uh, diabetes type 1 and he's deaf. And uh, I'm actually going to be starting a program where I'm going to try and get the uh, California Children's Services to make uh, access to insulin pumps a lot easier. Because right now it's very difficult for those people who are financial hardships or can't get around or can't leave their families because they're raising single moms, raising a bunch mm -hmm. of kids, mm -hmm. uh, get the access they need to install the insulin pump. That's one of my goals uh, this year, as a matter of fact. That's wonderful. So through the blessing of just having one grandson, you're allowed to pay it forward and help so many people. I'm going to try and do Keep that. Keep us posted on that. Sure. So tell me a little bit about yourself, George. How did you get started in law? Well, when I was a little kid, um, I wanted to be a a sanitation engineer, yeah, a garbage man. That looked so exciting when you lived in, in New York City. The garbage trucks hanging on the trucks. Looked like a really great <laughs> opportunity. But you grow out of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was about 14 or 15, uh, my sister took me to a visit to uh, a brother of one of her best friend's office in Manhattan. Uh, we were there for a visit uh, into the city. And uh, he was a lawyer, a very, very successful labor relations attorney. And I looked around his office, and boy, was I impressed. What a great office. Nice books, great conference room, really nice place to be. If that's what a lawyer has, I want to be a lawyer. And that's how I started down that track. In addition to my mother telling me, why don't you be a lawyer or a doctor? <laughs> nice but yeah, point. I think I started in that direction around then. And healthcare law specifically, when did you decide to focus oh, on healthcare Oh, I didn't focus law? on healthcare law till. Um, I had been practicing probably about five years in a general practice law firm in a very poor indigent community mm -hmm. uh, in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, Ocean Hill, Brownsville area, where I handle criminal cases, real estate, wills, states, closings on houses, personal injury type of actions. But then I had the opportunity to join a, a larger firm uh, after five years of doing some good trial work, and I started representing physicians mm -hmm. in their private practice, their divorces, their, um, uh, their private affairs, not their medical uh, mm -hmm. history. Mm -hmm. And then I, um, I had uh, fortuitously taken the California bar, and I really didn't get to start representing hospitals, health care providers, until I moved to California in 1982. So tell me, why, why do you do what you do? Why do you do this for a living? Well, you know, I'm very fortunate because I have this expression, I tell my son this all the time, that he's also in a field that he loves working in. There's very few people that um, have a job that they like to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm very fortunate I have a job I like to do because in the legal profession, I see an opportunity to help people and, and help organizations and, and give back because of my education and gain from it also. I mean, I, I have to say that it's been fortunate for me uh, because it helps me live the lifestyle I like and, and, and bring up my family from a monetary standpoint, but it's the type of profession where you could give back and where your education uh, that you've taken uh, provides you with a good background and the profession itself 
gives you such war, uh, rewarding experiences with people. Mm -hmm. And I love dealing with people. It's a, I find it a, a people business. And um, that's why I enjoy what I'm doing. So speaking of PFS, patient financial services specifically, um, what advice would you give anyone in particular, but say the mid-level PFS professional, someone with perhaps five to 10 plus years experience under their belt that has perhaps another 20 years or so, you know, unless we all win the lotto, in their work history to give. What advice would you give them for success and happiness and keeping their sanity in this profession? Well, keeping one's sanity in this profession at this time is real tough uh, because of what's happening with uh, the regulations, healthcare reform, and the regulations that are coming down the pike. You know, the healthcare reform is a, is a huge document with like 2,000 regulations that are going to be amended and all that. It puts a lot of pressure on the people that are in the profession. Uh, the compliance issues, uh, the issues of reduced reimbursement, so there's going to be cutbacks. And I think that I'm very optimistic about health care because I think it has offers tremendous employment opportunities and growth, but in order to participate in it, you've got to stay on top of it and stay educated. So my advice to these professionals is don't give up on the organizational relationships that they have. Uh, don't give up on the networking opportunities they have. Uh, continue to educate. And even if they can't afford it, because the organization doesn't budget for education anymore or doesn't budget for this type of training, there's so much availability through the Internet. There's so much free uh, and instructional information that's available on the Internet through webinars or at minimum cost. They should continue to develop that and continue to learn because in that way, they not only network with opportunities, but they also learn. If you have a question and you know someone in the organization uh, with a similar experience, or even if you don't, you can call someone in Virginia, pose the question to them, and you may get a solution that you could bring back to work and share with others or even communicate to your immediate supervisor and to share with them. And uh, you can get that through organizational activity. So staying in touch, not being in your ivory tower and managing people. Don't lose sight that you are part of a network of individuals uh, who can share information uh, and problems. What would you like to be remembered for? Another big pie in the sky question. But if if there's a few things that really mean a lot to you that you'd like to be remembered for, what are they? Well, one thing I learned from, actually, I learned from, from my mentors, basically, but my baseball coach uh, when I was 13 or 14. Uh, there's a guy that, and I, and I want to try and pass it on, uh, taught me that um, no matter whether you make an error, whether you strike out, whether you curse out the umpire, you have to walk away from every game uh, saying you did the best you can. And that should be true about every activity. And I want to be able to say that whatever I did, uh, family-wise, uh, career-wise, socially, in my sports, in any of my activities, I did the best I could. And I want, I want to walk away knowing I did that consistently. I also want people to know that I think it's very important, um, in my case, I'm a lawyer, uh, a man, a human being, that you're a human being first, and you're a male second, and then you're the profession or whatever career path third. That it's very important to recognize from whence you came and to make sure that you follow the golden rule. And, 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 and that, that humanity, uh, I want to I be able to leave that behind and, and let people understand that that's so important mm -hmm. uh, in everyday life, 24-7. So, George, we, at all the organizations you mentioned above, especially AHIM Western Region, want to thank you for all your years of ag advocacy and service and just the passion and the heart that you've given us all volunteer. It's... Um, it, it's really priceless, and it can never be paid back. But we appreciate you so much. So I wanted to say thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today for our first episode of AHEM Western Region's PFS Profiles and Courage.